Shalom, and welcome to Via Havta Yisrael, a Hebrew phrase which means you shall love Israel. We hope you'll stay with us for the next 30 minutes as our teacher, Dr. Baruch, shares his expository teaching from the Bible. Dr. Baruch is the senior lecturer at the Zera Avraham Institute based in Israel. Although all courses are taught in Hebrew at the Institute, Dr. Baruch is pleased to share this weekly address in English. To find out more about our work in Israel, please visit us on the web at loveisrael.org. That's one word, loveisrael.org. Now, here's Baruch with today's lesson. Death is a subject that is relevant for all human beings because we will leave this body in one of two ways. We will either die and our soul will go elsewhere or if we're a believer and if we're alive at the time of our blessed hope, this body will be changed and our soul will inhabit a new body a kingdom body. And we're going to be speaking about death tonight because Paul says some most encouraging words to the believers concerning this subject. So with that said, take out your Bible and look with me to 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. 2 Corinthians and chapter 5. In this study, we're going to look only at the first half of this chapter, the first 10 verses. And here Paul speaks clearly. He speaks with the authority of the Holy Spirit in order that we might know the truth concerning death and what happens after one dies. So let's get started. Let's look at verse 1. And a very important word that is contained here in this passage is the word we. So Paul is speaking not to the world, but he's speaking about an experience that only believers will have. So this scripture is most relevant to those who are believers in Messiah. These promises, this good news, this hope that we have is one that is reserved for those who have accepted Messiah Yeshua into their life. Let's begin verse 1. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he writes, For we know that if our earthly house. Now, the earthly house that he's speaking of is not where we reside, what address, where our home is located. He's using figurative language. When he says our earthly house, he's not speaking about our home, our apartment, where we dwell but rather he's talking about our body, where our soul resides. And this is going to become very obvious. It's not an interpretation. I can be dogmatic and very, very strong in that view because I've read the other verses in this section. It's clear that he's speaking about our body because later on he'll say our body. And when we look at verse 1, let's Press on, he says, for we know. And this is a word that has to do with knowing in the past, knowing now, and nothing will change this in the future. We can be assured of this. See, we always have to pay attention to the vocabulary. There is a difference between the word gnosko for knowing something and the word oida for knowing that. And that's why if we're going to enter into a discussion about the scripture, the vocabulary that Paul, the authors of, of a particular passage, we need to know the language, the words that they chose, and the implications for why they chose one word rather than another word. They both mean no, but they have some very serious implications to them. And therefore, he says, for we know that if, and we see the subjective. And this is important because he's speaking here about a, a possibility, something that will happen, but we don't know necessarily when. So that's why it's in the subjunctive. I said that wrong the first time, the subjunctive. So he says, for if 
our earthly bodies, and that's what he's speaking about, our earthly house. And then he has a phrase, to, this is the, but it's in the sense of of. And then we have a word. If I said the word skin, you know, the body's covered with skin. And this is a word here, skinos, which is the word translated tent. So he says, A person, for example, dwells in a tent. That was very common at one time. Now our souls, we have an earthly tent. And what is that? As he's going to tell us, it's our body. So now he's using terms in order to clarify to his audience what he's speaking about. Let's look again at this first verse. For we know that if our earthly house of the tent, of the skin, should be, and this is what is the subjunctive, should be destroyed. Now, it's going to be, but we don't know when. So whenever this happens, whenever our our earthly body, what he calls our dwelling place, our home at the present time. When our earthly body should be destroyed, he says, a dwelling place. And he uses a similar word, but it's different. Where the first one was speaking about a a house, a dwelling place, this is speaking about perhaps a building. It is to contrast and speak about something that is greater, something that is larger having more significance. And he says, a building from God we have. So we can have assurance. He tells us that if our earthly body is destroyed, and it's really when it will be destroyed, it's going to be no more. It's going to give away. But this should not cause us anxiety, uncertainty, fear, dread, for we, here again, only two believers, for we have, and notice what he says, a building from God. And now he's going to describe this building. And he goes back to the word house, a place of intimacy, a place of safety, a place of of security. He says, a house But then he has a phrase, being made by hands. And he has a prefix in front of it, which means not made by human hands. So if something exists in the scripture that is not made by human hands, normally we assume it to be, and rightly so, that it's made by God. And this is confirmed, we've already saw where it says, a building from God we have. A home not made by human hands, but one. And because God makes it, we know something. Look at the next part of verse 1 at the end where it says, eternal in the heavens. Now, the term heavens here is also connected to God. It also, heavens is also a word that's frequently in the new covenant connected to the kingdom. We have the kingdom of heaven and we have the kingdom of God. So heaven is frequently a kingdom word. So once more, we know something. We know that if our earthly house of of skin, of a tent, should be destroyed, a building from God we have, a house not made by human hands, but rather, he says, one that is eternal in the heavens. Verse 2. Now, before we look at this second verse, that's good news. So I don't need to be fearful, if I'm a believer, about my body. What ultimately is going to happen to it? Because we see something. When my earthly body should be no more, of destruction, of decay, of of no more inhabitable, then I have something. I have a building 
that God has made that's eternal, and it's in the heaven. It has a kingdom connection. That's what undeniably verse 1 is saying. Now, let me point out that we're going to see later on that there's not a, a time period between these two things, meaning there's no evidence here that when one dies, that they go into a state of sleep. Paul says nothing about it here. Now, does the Bible talk about sleep? Yes, but it's speaking about sleep, as I've said so many times, simply using that term to say, are you afraid of sleeping? No one's afraid of sleeping. Therefore, we shouldn't be afraid of death. Why aren't you afraid of sleeping? Because you expect to wake up. You have that assurance. I take a nap. I go to bed at night. But in the morning or when I wake up, I do just that. I start again my life. I just took a rest. It's not the end. Sleep isn't an end. It's simply rest. And what he's saying here in this same way, death isn't an end. Death is simply a transition. This is what Paul's going to emphasize and I believe has. He says, if our earthly body has been destroyed, we have a heavenly body, one that's not made with human hands, but by God, and it's connected to the kingdom. Now, when we go to verse two, it's going to get more specific. For also in this. Now, What's he referring to when he says, in this? Well, the word this is a demonstrative pronoun. Now, we all know what a pronoun is. If we're talking about Reuven, we can say Reuven this, Reuven that, and then we can say he. He is a son of Yaakov. Who is? Reuven. So he is simply a pronoun that, that relates to Reuven in this example. Well, a demonstrative pronoun is not he, but this, and it's demonstrative because it points out. It is a strong indicator. So whenever we have a demonstrative pronoun, we need to realize that something being something is being pointed out in a very demonstrative way in regard to the subject, the subject of the pronoun. And what is that? This house. So he says here, for also in this, meaning this house, which is referring to this body. So as long as we are in this body, this earthly body, dwelling in skin in this tent, as Paul says, what do we do? We groan. And this is a word that expresses sorrow. It can express pain. It can express discouragement. And when we live in this world, we have those things. Some days, how are things going? Very well. But it's not too long until we have something that interrupts that, that joy, that, that peace, that happiness. We hear something, we experience something, we learn something, whatever it might be, that causes us to have sorrow, to have feelings that are, are not pleasing. And this is what he says. He says, for also in this, this body, we groan. Now, we're groaning currently, and we also desire something. What is that? Well, notice what he says. He speaks about once more this, this building, this building, which is from heaven. And notice what he says. Not just any building, but he uses are building from heaven to be clothed. And then he says, we yearn for. We, and it's a word for a strong, passionate, intense desire. Now, we know something. Paul is laying the foundation to teach a principle. He's already alluded to it, and that's this. When I'm in this body, I have things that are not pleasing that are not comfortable, that are full of stress, anxiety, sorrow, pain, all of those things. 
And it's for this reason, Paul says, however, our building from heaven, our heavenly home, he says, we're going to be clothed with. Now that's important because there's a word here that speaks about a change, a transformation, whereby we were in a tent, this body he calls in verse 1, a tent using the word that we get in English, the word skin from. We have this skin that usually we think of our body. And he says, I long for, I strongly desire, I want desperately, I'm passionate about what? He says, about our dwelling place from heaven to be clothed, meaning to put this on, to have a new body, a new covering. And this covering, as we have seen, is a kingdom covering. It's a kingdom body that we're going to dwell in for how long? Well, it tells us at the end of verse 1, for eternity. The word, the last word in verse 2 is this word for yearning, desiring in a very strong thing. So Paul says, we yearn for, we desire intensely this heavenly body. Now, why would we have such a strong desire for it if now we're in a earthly body? Very simply, it's this new body. This one that only believers will receive. It is far superior. It is better. And it is superior in every way. That's what he's trying to convey to us. Verse 3. For if we also are clothed. Now, he's talking about, again, this future. This new body we're going to have, a covering. So he says, if, or we could translate it since, also, since, also being clothed. And the implication is with this new body, he says, not naked, we will be found. So in the future, when that first body goes away, decays, disappear, is destroyed, returns to ashes and dust. He says, we're not going to be naked, but rather he speaks about being clothed. And what's very important is we are going to be found to be clothed, not naked. Now, the term naked in the Bible is frequently associated with shame. One who has nothing pleasing to God is naked or he has dirty clothes, filthy garments. That speaks about unrighteousness. But ones that are clothed properly says in the scripture that the clothes are the righteous acts of the saints in regard to the bride of Messiah. And this is what this is alluding to, that we won't be naked, we won't be ashamed, because we are going to be clothed and this is how we're going to be found, and the implication is found by God. Verse 4. For also the ones being in the skin, it's that same word for tent. The first time he used it, it was this earthly tent. What we dwell in right now, what's we? The very essence of a human being. It is that neshema, that soul the spirit of man, and that dwells currently in this body. And as long as it's there, what does he say? Very carefully, verse 4. For also the ones being in the tent, he says it a second time, what do we do? We groan. It is a word of, of relating to, expressing pain, sorrow, grief, sadness, suffering. That's what this body experiences. Now, we can know joy and happiness and pleasure, but more often than not, in this body, what does Paul say elsewhere? In the body, 
you're going to have trouble. And that's why, and we'll see this, Paul, if given an option, a choice, just for himself, he'd rather leave this earthly tent and put on that new body, that kingdom body. That's what his desire is for. He said that at the end of verse 1, we are passionate about this. Therefore, look at verse 4. For also the ones being in the skin, skin in the tent, we groan. Why? Being burdened. And then he says, unto which we do not want, we do not want not to be clothed. We don't want to be without clothes, but he says that we want to be clothed. In order that, in order that the the death, the mortality be swallowed up by life. So he says, it's not that we just want to dissipate, not exist. This world is full of pain and suffering and sorrow. We know it's going to get worse. It's going to get much, much, much worse. And a believer does not say, well, I just want to die and be done with it. Just end. One who wants to end life one who wants just to escape, to cease to be. This is not someone who has faith. We're passionate about a new body because that new body is connected to, and I hope you know where I'm going, it's connected to the kingdom. So Paul says here, it's not just because we groan and we're uh, burdened. He says, unto which... We do not want to be unclothed, but clothed in order that this body of death, this mortal body, that it be swallowed up, and I love this next phrase, by life. Now, we see there is that that consistent, throughout the scripture, this consistent relationship between a kingdom experience and the life. I have life now, I'm breathing, my heart's beating, but I don't have the life. Life in that new existence of the kingdom. This is what should excite us. This is what should motivate us and drive our behavior in this world. So Paul says, it's it's not that I want to be unclothed, meaning die but I want to be clothed in order that the mortality, and that word mortality is simply the word death in Hebrew, comes from the same origin, that that the mortal body should be swallowed up by life. Verse 5. Now he's going to tell us who brings that about. There is only one source that gives us this life, the life, the kingdom life. And that's why he says, look carefully at verse 5. We have a participle. It begins, but the one who is working this out for us, it says, this, this very thing, the same thing, what he's talking about, who's the one that works it out? He says, God, the Greek word theos, God does. He works this out for us. Why? We could never do it ourselves. We are a recipient. What does Messiah say? He says, if I go away, I will prepare a place for you, a dwelling place. This is what he's referring to. This, This place and also a new body for, specifically designed for that kingdom experience. Once more, verse five. But the one who works this out for us, this very thing is God. And he gives to us, and this is the proof, he gives to us the guarantee of the Spirit. Now, we know that there's something called earnest money. That is, I want to buy something, let's say a house, and I I want the deal to go through. I'm serious. So I give the seller money. I give a down payment, a a token of my sincerity that I'm going to follow through 
and pay for it all. So this is what the Spirit, one of His purposes, there are many, but we can be assured of a new body, a kingdom body, everlasting life, all that goes with it, because we have the Holy Spirit. So the fact that we are recipients of the Holy Spirit shows that we are in a new covenant relationship. It's only through a new covenant relationship that one can receive the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit. We see in the book of Isaiah, chapter 59, verse 20 and 21, that this new covenant experience that that begets our receiving of the Holy Spirit that causes us to receive the Holy Spirit is a covenant of redemption. So he writes, not only is he working this out for us, we can be assured because there's evidence of that. There's the earnest of that, and that is the Spirit, the Holy Spirit. Because of that, look now, verse 6, because I know there's nothing uncertain. I experience the work of the Holy Spirit in my life. I am tempted. The Holy Spirit tells me this is temptation. This is not something that you want to do. We see other times that the Holy Spirit supplies, he gives in order that God's will can be done. So because we experience the work, the ministry of the Holy Spirit, we can have assurance. And that's why, look now at verse 6. Therefore, being confident some of the times, no. What is that word? Pan tote. Pan is all, every. Tote is is a time. So at all times, we are confident, being confident. Why? We have confidence because we're basing our expectations. Our hope is founded in the promises of God. So he says, therefore, being confident at all times and knowing that. And then we have a very important word, the male. Now, this word, the male, it's a word for being at home, located at home. And that home can be broader. It can be part of a population or society. But in this case, he's talking about being in a body, at home in the body. That's how he's used this. He's not talking about being part of a community now. He's talking to the individual, a group of believers. And he says to each one, you had this earthly body, this tent that you dwell in. So he's using a word that speaks and it's the same word. Some will say present and absent. It's the same word. The only difference why we translate them differently is the prefix. One is N. N is the Greek preposition, which means in or at. And then we have the word ech, which means out of or from. So we have a word for home. So you're either at home, in your home, or you're from your home or out of your home. These are the two words that's going to be used here of great significance. And what what bothers me, because this is an issue that has uh, some strong theological differences, and when I discuss this with individuals, and I said, well, let's talk about the significance of this word. How's it translated in your Bible? Oh, present and absent, and they have all types of explanations. I said, well, what is the origin? What is the meaning, the base meaning of this word? They don't know. They've done no study of the original language, what this word means. And you don't have to have a a PhD, a master's degree, or anything. All you have to do is have a smartphone or a good library, but a smartphone and do some study. You go, you can click on this word, you see it in English, you can click and it gives you the Greek origin. And then you can click on that and find how this word is used other places inside the Bible, outside the Bible, the the etymology of the word, all of this so that you can understand what it's saying. So it's only after spending the time investing, doing the work, the due diligence, that you have a right to express an opinion. There's many people that have all types of theological ideas, 
they have no right to express them because it's based upon what they've heard, what they want, what they think, rather than thorough study. And the reason why I say you have no right, I'm not speaking of that from a, a right in society. Many places have free speech. So you have an earthly right. You just don't have a right before God. Because if you're going to share something in regard to the scripture, you have had to study previously to show yourself approved. You have to do the work. You don't want to share something that you really don't know about. That's why I say you have no right to do it. So let's look at this word, verse 6. And knowing that, and it has this word, to be at home. He says, knowing that to be at home in, and now it gets very clear, the body, the word summa. Here it's the word in a different construction, shumati. But it's being at home, being located in the body. So notice what he says. Knowing that being at home, being present in the body, it means something. It means that you are out of your heavenly home. He says, you're not at home. You are apart from the Lord. So what do we know here? As long as I'm in this flesh, this tent, this body, at home located in that, my soul, I am apart. I am absent from the Lord. I'm not present with him. Not present, absent. Not at home in this new body because in order to be with the Lord, I have to have this, this new condition. Now, we need to be careful because we see that there's the soul. The soul can be in the presence of God, but he's talking ultimately, ultimately of a kingdom experience. Now, one of the things we need to realize is that there's a difference between present day heaven and the kingdom of God. Now, why do I say that? Well, for example, we know something. We know that heaven is not eternal. Now, I say that, and many people, they're surprised by that. But we can look at the scripture, for example, in, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Peter is speaking, and he says, Nevertheless, according to the promise. I like that. He's basing his hope upon the promises of God. And he says, nevertheless, we, based upon the promises of God, we know something. He says, we know that, that we're going to be in the position, the place of righteousness. So we know that according to the promise of God, there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth where righteousness dwells. Second Peter 3.13. Also, we know, for example, in Matthew chapter 5 and verse 18, Messiah is speaking and he says that the relevance, the significance of the law, the Torah, will not give away, will not become obsolete will not pass away, not one, one jot, not one tittle, to use the language of the new covenant, until heaven and earth pass away. So it, it foreshadows, it, it teaches us there's going to be a new heaven and earth. And likewise, in Revelation chapter 21, verse 1, it speaks about there's going to be a new heaven and a new earth because the first heaven and the first earth pass away. So when we're talking about our, our eternal dwelling place, the kingdom of God, we're going to see that, that believers are going to have a new body. And that new body enables them to be in the kingdom of God of God. Now, I realize that when we look, for example, in the scripture, there's no indication that those who come to faith after the rapture, that they're going to have a new body. 
They might, but there's nothing that specifically says that. They're going to have to, one interpretation, is eat the, the leaves of the trees. Why? They're for healing. So for them not to dissipate, dissolve, decay, they're going to have to, out of obedience, take from those leaves of that tree. You can read as well in Revelation 21 and 22 about the new Jerusalem. But in a general sense, we find that it's this new body that enables us to dwell in the presence of God. And that's why he says, let's be very specific, Verse, verse 6, and knowing that being at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. And because of that, what do we do? Through faith, for through faith we walk and not by sight. So he says, as long as I, and not in this new body, not in the presence of God. I walk by faith, not what I see. In this world, seeing is not believing. Seeing leads us to be deceived. Things are not as they appear. We see things only in one dimension. The spiritual dimension, we don't perceive. We don't know the angelic realm, what's going on, the battles that are taking place around us. We do not see properly. Therefore, we don't make decisions solely on what we see, but we base them upon truth. That's what it means when it says we walk by faith and not by sight. Verse 8, he says again, and we being confident and it has a word here for, for thinking in a good way. So he says, but being confident and, and seeing or thinking well, having the right perception. So being confident and determining what is right, what is good, we, we conclude something. And what is that? He says, it's preferable. Now, it's a word, Malone. Malone here is rather. So he's see, seeking, speaking about something that is preferable, that he rather would have. And what is that? It's not hard to, to, to interpret this. He says, rather to be absent from the body. That is a word, to be out of home. From this body. So he says here, it's preferable. We prefer, I'd rather be absent, absent from the body. And what do we know? To be absent from the body is to be at home with, to be at home. What's his home? This new home, to be present with the Lord. So we learn something. We see no time period in between these things. Paul is saying two things. We are either going to be at home in this body, in this tent, or we're going to be in a new experience, a new home, ultimately. And when we die, we will go, there's nothing sleeping, there's no rest period, this time, it says to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord, to be at home with the Lord. There's two alternatives, either to be in this body, if you're a believer, or to be present with the Lord, at home with him. That's what he's saying. Very important that we see this simple message, this simple truth. So once again, but be confident and thinking well, thinking in a right way. We prefer, we'd rather be absent from this body and to be present with the Lord. Verse 9. Now, 9, the key word in verse 9 is a word of, in modern uh, uh, thought, 
This would be the word ambition. Having an ambition, what it speaks about is a strong, strong, strong desire, a passion about something. And this is why he says, look again, verse 9, therefore also being, being passionate, desiring, he says, rather, whether we are at home in the body or absent from the body, regardless, he says, I am desiring, I am ambitious to what? He says, to be well-pleasing to him, meaning the Lord. So regardless of my circumstances, Paul says, what I desire, regardless of if I'm in this body or I'm away from this body with him, regardless, what is his desire? What is he passionate for? What is he ambitious of? He says, to be well-pleasing to him. And I would encourage you to do a, a study of this word. It's a word, pleasing, and then the prefix, you, which is a particle, which means good. Instead of good, we would say not good pleasing, but well pleasing. If your Bible says, as many Bibles translate it, to be acceptable, not to be acceptable, but to be well pleasing to him. Last verse, verse 10. For all of us, and it's speaking here, when it says all of us, there's the definite article before all of us. And what does that mean? He's speaking to a specific group, all believers. So we write because non-believers are not going to, to appear before this judgment seat, the bima of Messiah. No, we find that non-believers are going to, and this is found at the end of Revelation chapter 20, they're going to appear before the great white throne judgment. True believers, we don't go to the great white throne of judgment. We go to this judgment. And it's entirely different for a different purpose. This is a judgment of rewards. And we find the great white throne judgment is a judgment of condemnation. Everyone who goes to the great white throne judgment will be tossed into the lake burning with fire. Verse 10. For all of us, it's necessary to appear before the bima, the judgment seat of Messiah. Why? In order that each of us, and then the word here refers to a payment, an outcome. So we have to go there because there's an outcome. Our actions, our deeds are going to produce a kingdom result. And what does he say? In order that each of us, that we receive, that we be compensated for what? The things through the body. And speaking about what we, done, what we have done in this body, why we were in this body. So the things that were through the body, according to everything, each one that he did. So we are going to be compensated. There's going to be an outcome. Messiah is going to render judgment in regard to all of the things that, that one has done in the body, whether these things be good or whether they're bad. What do we know about that? Well, in our study of 1 Corinthians 3, we had some, some commentary on that. And here's what we learn. Everything that we have done in the body, in the flesh, that's displeasing, that the scripture says is bad, Messiah went to the cross for that. We are going to understand the consequences of those actions in this world and for eternity, but, but Messiah's paid the price. Everything that's good that he did through us he gets all the praise and honor, but we're going to be rewarded. So we will suffer a loss of rewards. I've given the example, and we'll close with this. Given the example that, that Messiah, 
He is created. We have a, a purpose, a plan for our life, and all the rewards, if we were to faithfully carry out that plan, those rewards are waiting for us. And we're going to see, see them. But, but those things that were done that were evil, bad, not according to the will of God, we're going to see them being lost. Talks about in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, how they suffer loss. Those things that were remain, that were good, we're going to get the reward. So we're going to understand what our life could have been and what it was. When we were not faithful, what that faithlessness cost us, what's the result of it? This is the purpose of the Bema seat, the judgment seat of Messiah that every believer is, is going to go before. It is not the great white throne judgment. Those who go to the great white throne judgment, they are all, all of them, are non-believers, and they're going to be condemned eternally to that lake that burns with fire. So the message here is very simple. We are going to have a dwelling place. Now, the dwelling place ultimately is the kingdom of God. It is our new home. For those who take part in the rapture, we're going to have a kingdom-designed body for that. For those who do not, but that come to faith, there's nothing that says that they're ever going to receive a kingdom body. Perhaps they will, but there's no evidence of that. What we see is that there's a group of people in the New Jerusalem that are going to partake of the leaves of that tree of life, that that's going to give them healing for the nations. So there's much to be learned about this subject, but one thing that we can be assured of, to be absent from this body is to be present with the Lord, not in some state of unconsciousness, asleep in some condition. We don't see anything that speaks of that in the Bible. Well, I'll close with that until next week when we complete the second half of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Until then, shalom from Israel. Well, we hope you will benefit from today's message and share it with others. Please plan to join us each week at this time and on this channel for our broadcast of loveisrael.org. Again, to find out more about us, please visit our website, loveisrael.org. There you will find articles and numerous other lectures by Baruch. These teachings are in video form. You may download them or watch them in streaming video. Until next week, may the Lord bless you in our Messiah Yeshua, that is, Jesus, as you walk with Him. Shalom from Israel. Thank you.